it is a pleasure to be able to take part in this debate, and it is uh, a pretty big indictment on our Parliament that there's hardly any members here today to take part in what ought to be an incredibly serious discussion and a process of very serious self-criticism of the failure of Parliament both in 2003 and since then to hold to account those that took crucial decisions on our behalf, the consequences of which all of us will live with for the rest of our lives and the population of this country and indeed of Western Europe and the USA are going to live with for many, many, many decades and, and generations to come. It was a seminal disaster that happened in 2003. And I respect the member for Penrith and the Border for his knowledge, for his interest, for his commitment, but I absolutely profoundly disagree with his analysis. His analysis is essentially that um, we were good imperialists, then we became weak imperialists, and now we've got to be better imperialists. Two messages, really. One is, we can't afford it. And secondly, the, surely the lesson of the disaster of the 70th anniversary of Auschwitz is first to say, never again. Never let racism raise its ugly head, be it against Jews, Muslims, or anybody else but also to learn a very fundamental lesson that the crazy triumphalism of the Treaty of Versailles and that whole period in the 1920s led to the growth of the Nazis and led to the disasters. The whole Middle East, I'll give you one second, the whole Middle East region is still living with the disasters of Versailles, the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the borders that we uh, inherited. Yes. The danger of the Honourable Members anti-imperialist rhetoric is that we are not going to come to terms with how to prevent genocides in the future. What is the Honourable Member proposing in terms of reform, energy, compassion and confidence to deal with an Auschwitz-Birkenau, a Bosnia or a Rwanda in the future if all the Honourable Member has to say is we're a small country that can't afford to do anything in the world? Being the truth. A process of international law, a process of human rights engagement, a process of truth and honesty, and a process that we don't denigrate whole peoples and uh, turn the other way when human rights abuses take place. On a lesser example, but nevertheless an important one, we are apparently more interested in selling weapons to Saudi Arabia yeah. than we are in the human rights of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That can be multiplied in country after country after country across the world. If we're serious about human rights, we wouldn't provide the government with Bahrain, of Bahrain with equipment to kill and injure demonstrators that oppose what it does. Yeah. There has to be some honesty in the whole of our foreign policy. Well and if this debate does something, does anything, to make us start to think more seriously about foreign policy rather than racing headlong into spending £100 billion on Trident, developing more weapons and yet more weapons for our armoury, surely that will be something. Yeah, yeah. We've had inquiry after inquiry after inquiry on Iraq. Parliament showed it was a failure and couldn't do it. There was the Butler inquiry, there was a Foreign Affairs Committee inquiry, and so we then ended up with the Chilcot inquiry. Now, I voted in 2006, despite the endeavours of the Labour Whip's office, with an opposition motion. Actually, I wasn't that bothered with the endeavours of the Labour Whip's office at that time, yeah. uh, or on a number of, on one or two other occasions for that matter, and um, because I thought to set up an inquiry was the right thing to do. However, I don't really think it's the job of Parliament to pass its duties on to somebody else to do it, then complain vaguely when they don't report because uh, we are not going to interfere with the inquiry. It really is our failure. There should have been a serious, I think, judicial-led inquiry with Council that could uh, ask some really good questions of Tony Blair, of the member for Blackburn, of a whole lot of other people. Michael Mansfield QC would have been a very good interrogator yeah, 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 and I yeah. think that uh, a few days of interrogation by Michael Mansfield yeah, yeah. we'd have gained far more truth than these uh, showman-like trips of Tony Blair to the inquiry and uh, his um, lucrative tours around the world to say he'd do all the same again. He clearly hasn't learnt the lessons of it. 
Now, I remember those debates very well. I am chair of the Stop the War Coalition, and uh, I've been involved in every um, demonstration that I can think of against this war, and indeed spoke to that million-strong audience in Hyde Park that day in Febru on February the 15th, 2003. And there was something quite amazing about it. I was there with many others in this house on that huge platform we had looking out on Hyde Park with a million people there and hundreds of thousands more who couldn't even get into Hyde Park. This is after we'd been told that Hyde Park wasn't available and that we should have the meeting in Battersea Park by the Cabinet Office, who I resisted that temptation to go to Battersea Park on a Saturday afternoon, and we persisted with Hyde Park. I saw people there who politically profoundly disagree with me. Profoundly disagree. I saw people that had never been at a public meeting or a demonstration in their lives, were so moved by the obvious lies that they'd been told that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that's why we had to go to war, and uh, they opposed it. Everyone there learned a lesson that day, and the cynicism that we meet on the doorstep as we approach an election is in part because of the contempt Parliament showed on that particular day. I won't go on much longer, Madam Deputy Speaker. I just want to say this. The idea that members were not aware of the uh, um, misinformation concerning Iraq really doesn't cut much ice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had the dodgy dossier. I remember arriving in Parliament at 8 o'clock in the morning to read this heroic document. I was the first there at the downstairs table office. I knocked on the door at one minute to eight. They wouldn't open it, but at the moment the door opened at eight o'clock, I put my hand in and grabbed two copies. I gave one to Glenn Rangwalla, an excellent academic from Cambridge, and the other I kept myself. He went off to one place to read it. I went to my office to read it, and 20 minutes later, we phoned each other up and said, this thing is nonsense. This thing is utter nonsense. Who could possibly believe this stuff? The House did. Some members of the Security Council did. Not France, not Russia, not China, not a lot of other countries either. I also remember the extraordinary pressure MPs were put under to vote in that debate. I remember a meeting with Tony Blair where a number of us who could reasonably be described as Iraq sceptics met Tony Blair in the room at the back there of the chamber. And, uh, after we'd been around the track several times with him wishing not to engage in this discussion, others of us wishing to engage, he sort of started looking at his watch, said, I've got to go now. And I said, Tony, just one question. Why are we doing this? He slapped his hand on the table and said, it's the right thing to do. That's why we're doing it. I said, that's not an answer. He said, that, that's the only one you're going to get. And that was the enthralled fish. enthralling answer that we got from him. So the lessons surely are yes. When the Foreign Affairs Committee interviews Sir John Chilcott next week, I hope they will ask him how he's getting on with getting um, records of the um, uh, barbecue discussion between Blair and Bush, the correspondence that went on, the handwritten notes that went on that maybe civil servants didn't know about, maybe the Foreign Office didn't know about, maybe a lot of people didn't know about them, because that was, I understand, some of Tony Blair's charm and style, was to do things differently to anybody else so they didn't know what was going on. Um, I also hope that they will get from him an exact date this document will finally be published. But I think I'm going to be disappointed because I suspect it's going to be full of redactions and we'll have to read a million words until we know what bits have been redacted from it. This isn't going to go away. This issue is not going to go away. We need to get to the truth. We need a War Powers Act so that every MP is um, involved in decisions to send British troops abroad and elsewhere. But to follow what the member for Penrith and the Border said, I agree with him that we need to have a serious debate about foreign policy. We need to have a serious debate about what our place in the world actually is. Other countries that once had massive empires have learnt those lessons. I recall sitting in Vienna in December, when the representative of the Austrian government proudly said, our government has no nuclear weapons, wants no nuclear weapons, will never have any nuclear weapons, we want to be a force for peace in the world. That was once the centre of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You can look at every other centre of European empires where most of them have learnt lessons. Maybe, maybe the disaster of Iraq the growth of Al-Qaeda, the growth of ISIS, the growth of all those other forces that have been let loose 
by the disaster of the Iraq war will be a lesson that we've had to learn the very hard way. But if we don't learn it, we will suffer to repeat it again and again and again. I don't want to go to war memorials. I don't want to go to memorial services. I want us to be a real influence for peace, for justice and human rights around the world. You don't achieve that by lying to Parliament. You don't achieve that by invading countries that don't have weapons that you claimed you had. Yeah.